So I'm going to uh, tell you about some of the things that we did in Cincinnati. I have some notes here and I'm going to attempt to read them. I printed them out on green paper uh, so that I could see them a little bit better. I used to wear um, glasses and I went to contact, so it's kind of hard to, hard to see things up close now. Actually, I was at the airport. I was on my way here and I uh, saw this guy and uh, you know the politicians in the room will understand this. And this guy says, hey, Mayor, how are you doing? And I'm looking at the guy and I just, I just don't remember who he is. And he looks at me, he says, how are you doing? He took his hat off and I'm looking at him. I, I can't figure this guy out. And he says, oh, I'm going to play golf with, with uh, Dr. Poole. And I said, Dr. Poole? And I'm thinking, oh, doctor, he must be a doctor. Wait a minute, this guy's my eye doctor. <laughs> and I can't even see him. <laughs> a lot of good he's doing me, I'll tell you that right now. But anyway, um, I was invited here to give you a sense of the transformation that we have seen in the great city of Cincinnati during my time as mayor. And uh, I'm going to talk through a, a few projects that we worked on. I'm going to show you some slides because you can't get out of here without seeing slides. And then I'm going to answer some questions. And I, I hope that you can uh, follow me as I try to, like, you know, flip slides and flip these notes all at the same time. So let me start by reading the introduction of one of the State of the City addresses that I did when I was mayor. This is what I said. I came out and I thanked everybody for being there and I just started talking. I said, times are tough across the country. Banks are not lending money, people are out of work, and citizens are worried about their futures. Two guys decide that they're going to go into business for themselves. Let's, let's call them Bill and Jim. So Bill and Jim, against all odds, invest their wisdom, their time, their money, and they built this company. And all kinds of people are telling them, now is not the right time. You should not go into business now. You cannot start a company in these economic times. If those two men had listened to the naysayers, Cincinnati would not be home to the largest consumer products company in the world, Procter & Gamble. William Procter and James Gamble were those two gentlemen. Times might be tough right now, but that doesn't mean that we stop. That doesn't mean that we give up. That's when you fight the hardest, when we're facing some of the toughest challenges of the day. Bill and Jim faced those challenges in 1837, and I'm sure they heard plenty of negative things about what they were doing. Now's not the time. They say the same thing today. The naysayers keep saying, uh, we need to slow down. We need to pull back. This is not the right time. Well, people use the phrase in these economic times as an excuse to pull back, as a reason to not do things. But I think they have it backwards. It's in these economic times that you put money into things that you know are going to grow your future. That's when you take bold steps and you do the things that are going to make you prosper. And that's exactly what we did in the city of Cincinnati, and that's how we grew. So what are the elements of a successful city, a 21st century city today? They're actually very similar to the same elements that led cities in the 20th century to success. A strong urban core, density, walkable communities, integrated transportation systems, all built around a city's set of assets, where people live and where they work. Those are strategies from the 20th century that worked, and they created strong, dynamic cities all across our country. And those were, those were smart growth strategies. We didn't call them that uh, back then, but that's what they are. They built strong cities. So today, those smart growth strategies that are leading the resurgence of cities are being implemented all across our country. And it's uh, my belief that by returning to those same strategies that we're able to return some cities to their previous glory. That's what's at the heart of smart growth. So, Let's go back for a minute. I want to, I want to tell you about Cincinnati. So uh, like a lot of older <clears throat> Midwestern cities, we saw our best times uh, from around the turn of the 20th century up to about the 1960s. Uh, we uh, you know, had all kinds of great things going on in our city. Uh, but in the late 50s, early 60s, people started to, to move out. They started to go uh, into the suburbs. Our economy suffered from a loss of manufacturing. Uh, our downtown closed up shop at 5 o'clock, and uh, everybody raced home, and the city seemed to languish for a number of decades. 
And our biggest problem was that we had really lost our way. We lost our mojo. Uh, we had forgotten that we were this great and progressive city. We had forgotten uh, that we had this great history. And that was crazy to me because that was in stark contrast to uh, what I thought about when I thought about our ancestors who built such a great city. And I thought about the creation of Procter & Gamble and the Kroger Company. We're talking about uh, the city of Cincinnati, a city that taxed itself in the 1870s to build an interstate railroad, one that we still have today, produces about $20 million a year uh, for our budget. This is the uh, first city to formally adopt a comprehensive plan in 1925. This is a progressive city. I mean, things are going on here. But I'll tell you, a half century of population loss will really take a toll on your psyche. So we had turned into this, you know, city of we can't do it, of it won't work here. You know, things, things, you know, we, we just got really down on ourselves and people were just, you know, uh, it's not going to work here. I said, well, I want to work with because Cincinnati is different. It's different here. You know, they acted like, you know, wind didn't blow in our city. So, you know, <laughs> like we couldn't do anything right. We just couldn't do anything right. But there was this pervasive attitude that it was just terrible and everything was awful. And then there was the cow incident. Do you guys, there's some people here from Cincinnati. Do you guys remember the cow incident? Are you familiar with this? Do you remember this? So there's this cow that's in a slaughterhouse. You know, Cincinnati was big in slaughterhouses years ago. And this cow is being led down the stocks to its impending doom. And, and the cow, for whatever reason, decides today is not the day for me. <laughs> so the cow, like, jumped out of the, of the retaining fence somehow and knocked the workers over and, and busted through the door and ran out into the streets of Cincinnati. <laughs> and they chased the cow. This is a true story. And, and we called the police. Because when a cow's loose on your streets, you need to call the cops. <laughs> and the police called the, the sheriff's office because the sheriff has a helicopter. And the helicopter has like heat seeking uh, equipment on it, right, to find uh, the cow. They still couldn't find the cow. So people mounted horses. And, and we sent out search parties. And we looked for this cow for 11 days. <laughs> We searched for this cow, and we couldn't find it. And finally, finally, the cow was spotted in a park not far from the slaughterhouse. And they cornered the cow, they shot it with tranquilizers, and they loaded it onto a truck. And of course, in typical Cincinnati fashion, we did not slaughter that cow. Uh, that cow was sent to a farm in upstate New York for wayward cows. <laughs> so I decided to run for mayor. Because if we can't catch a cow in 11 days <laughs> running through our streets, there is something wrong. I wanted to bring us back, back to being a cutting edge city, back to a city with strong leadership, visionary leadership. So I ran, I won, and I set about trying to change people's attitudes about the city of Cincinnati. And I reminded people of, of you know, why this city was so great in the first place and what we really needed to do to be able to take on these tough issues. And I declared, I remember in another speech, I declared that Cincinnati was a city worthy of investment. A city worthy of investment. And people kind of reacted to that because I don't think they had seen it that way before. And I said it, and I meant it. And I called on people to be active and engaged in the resurgence of Cincinnati. And I called on people to come back downtown. I mean, it's the simplest thing, come back downtown. Because the focus on downtown is critical. People assess the vitality of your entire city just by looking at downtown. So we needed to bring the energy back. We needed to uh, tear down the skywalks. We had these skywalks in Cincinnati, these elevated walkways that kept people off the streets. So we started tearing those down, bringing people back down onto the streets, forcing them back into their own community. And so we also focused on revitalizing our public square, Fountain Square. Now, before I was mayor, uh, 3CDC was created. 3CDC stands for the Cincinnati City Center Development Corporation. 3CDC. You cannot say that fast. You can say 3CDC fast. Uh, but it's a, it's a 501c3, and uh, they are doing some great works. Now, I'm going to try to work the slide thing now because, because, see, that's 3CDC. See, there it is. It says the Cincinnati 
Center City Development Corporation, for those of you who can't see it in the back. And uh, it's a nonprofit. It was started in 2003. Uh, it's a combination of public funding and private investment that leverages even more money to take on great challenges. Uh, they operate two private development funds, the Cincinnati New Markets Fund and the Cincinnati Equity Fund, uh, that are worth more than $250 million at this point in time. So I'll get into some of those details a little bit later. Uh, but 3CDC is governed by a board uh, of 30 corporate leaders. These are the top corporations in the city of Cincinnati that make up 3CDC. So 3CDC works collaboratively with the state of Ohio and the city of Cincinnati, of course. And uh, again, we're fortunate to have such a very strong corporate community in our city uh, in order to be able to get things done. So Fountain Square has been our, uh, well, I should have shown you that slide before. See, it, usually somebody pushes these buttons for me, so I have to do this myself. These are the priorities, uh, 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 great uh, civic spaces, high density mixed use development, uh, the preservation of historic structures and the improvement of streetscapes. And I can't read the last thing over there because my doctor uh, is not very good. <laughs> so uh, I think that says creating diverse mixed income neighborhoods. Uh, supported by local businesses. So those are the priorities of 3CDC. So this is Fountain Square in 1907. Uh, we relocated Fountain Square uh, again at some point later, and then we relocated it again because we just, I don't know, we just can't leave a fountain sitting where it is. We have to keep moving it around. And so this is uh, Fountain Square in the 1970s. And you can see people are feeding uh, the pigeons there. This was one of the things you used to do if you went to Fountain Square. You would feed the pigeons or protest. Those were, actually I think it was an ordinance that said you could only do those two things. Um, and then there was the pigeons, see, before I was mayor they had crazy tactics, right? So there was a pigeon problem on Fountain Square and so they came up with this idea to deal with the pigeons. They went and got six falcons, <laughs> right? And they released the falcons to go down to Fountain Square to deal with the pigeons. And let me tell you, it was a massacre. <laughs> I mean, these falcons tore these pigeons apart. There were little uh, pigeon beaks and bloody feathers and little tiny little pigeon legs just flying about. And kids were mortified. They were screaming and holding onto their parents' legs. And it was, I mean, it was awful. But there are no more pigeons there. Anyway, let me show you what the square looked like before the renovation. So there were all these uh, nooks and crannies and all these walls, and you can see it's, it's just not a very attractive place to be. It's difficult to see how you get to various parts of the square. Um, this is an after picture, so it was reworked so that you could basically just walk right up onto the square and you didn't have uh, all of those walls that faced you. Uh, this is another example of, of uh, what you were faced with from the street level. And you see there's just the, just the one guy, right? He's trying to escape. <laughs> and, and then uh, this is an after picture. Uh, this is before, this is the original uh, 1960s, I guess, placement of the square. And it was moved a little further back, giving you greater access and direct access from the street. I don't know where I'm supposed to point this, but uh, this is another example of the wall, and before, no people, after, lots of people, before, no people, after, lots of people, before, our ice skating rink, which is set up in the winter, very few people, after, lots and lots of people. Now, this is, this is not a digitally enhanced photograph at all. Uh, this is the lighting of the Christmas tree uh, that we do the day after Thanksgiving. And uh, if you look very closely, you can see me right by the tree. <laughs> I have on a black suit. And uh, this is uh, the excitement that the square brings today. Uh, and it's very dramatic. So this is, is what has happened with our... Oh, th th see that? Who did that? That's fantastic. Oh, wow, look at this. Uh, because... Now I have one more thing to deal with, thank you. <laughs> yeah, see that's me right there, okay. And, so I'm not sure what the next slide is. Ah, the banks, 
the banks. So in the 1970s, uh, we built a, a, uh, a new stadium. Actually, I think it was built in 1969. It was Riverfront Stadium. The, the sports fans will be familiar with Riverfront Stadium. Uh, it was a fantastic place, at least I thought. Uh, but by the 1990s, uh, it was old. And so, you know, because that's a long time to have a stadium from, you know, 1969 to 1994. That's like a long time, right? And so uh, the stadium was, was torn down and there was this plan hatched to build two new stadiums because you have to have, see, this is the old stadium. You have to have a couple new stadiums because we have two teams. We have a football team and a baseball team. So each of them had to have their own separate stadium. And I think we shouldn't have stopped just at the two because we really should have built each team a stadium for each day of the week. <laughs> so we could have had 14 stadiums. If you can imagine the economic impact of 14 stadiums being constructed all at one time, that would be transformative. Um, <laughs> you guys are funny. And so this is what the scene looks like now. And so now I have to pick up this other piece. So this is the new uh, baseball stadium, and this is the football stadium, and this is the Freedom Center, and all of the space that you see between the two is the area that is planned as the bank's development. And it's a, a, a lot of acreage. And it's somewhere between, and you'll have to forgive me, but it's somewhere between two and 120 acres. <laughs> I, I don't know, because my notes say 120. That doesn't seem right to me, but whatever. And so, the, the plan is that the entire site uh, uh, will, will, will be a subterranean parking garage as its, as its base. And it will be, um, again, my notes say it will hold 3,500 cars, but I want to say it's going to hold more like 30,000 cars or 150,000 cars. I mean, this is going to be like the largest underground parking structure on Earth. <laughs> and this in itself will be a tourist attraction. People will come here to see, you know, how long it took them to find their car from Sweden. Um, you have to use what you have, you see. <clears throat> um, but, but really, the, 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 the garage will serve as, a mix, uh, as the uh, basis for this mixed-use development. So you can see this is a rendering of what the site would then look like when it's completely built out. This is 10 phases in total. Uh, and we have uh, started construction on uh, the, just the second phase uh, that I will show you in a moment. And so uh, this is what it looked like when I took office. Just a, a, a mud pit and, and not much going on. Uh, this is during the construction, and you can see things are, are happening there. Um, this is a guy walking around with pipes. Um, an art hat, you have to have that. And uh, this is a continuation of phase one. And this is what it looks like now. And this is a picture of opening day. And again, I'm there. You can see me. I'm wearing red <laughs> right there, I think. And so there's also a 45-acre uh, park that goes along with, uh, with the Banks project. Uh, this is a rendering, a really like a not good one, uh, but a not good rendering of uh, phase two, where uh, GE has announced that they're going to bring their global operations center to Cincinnati and, and headquarter it there, and they're bringing 2,000 jobs with it. So, um, and these, this is the park. This is a small park. Kids are playing in the water, and at night the water has different colors in it, and it's very exciting. And so uh, that is the park. Now. Um, this site is a site that was to be developed previously. Uh, the deal fell apart before I was mayor, and uh, we were able to put a deal together with 3CDC's help that will develop the Dunhumby Center there. If you have a CVS card or a Kroger card, the, uh, the loyalty cards, Dunhumby is the company behind most of those cards. They started their U.S. operations in Cincinnati in probably 2002 or three, uh, with like four employees. Uh, they now have 700 employees, and they're going to grow to 1,500 employees in a new office tower at that site uh, in about three years. This is me uh, at a podium. 
I'm not sure why that's in there. <laughs> but this is a rendering of the uh, Dunhumby uh, Center, which uh, is under construction now and looks absolutely nothing like that. So I'm not sure why I keep showing you slides of things that don't look anything like uh, they're supposed to. But anyway, now I want to tell you about the Over the Rhine neighborhood. Um, you can see by this map the proximity of Over the Rhine to the Central Business District. So this is Central Parkway, and this used to be a canal back in the day. This is all the Central Business District here, and this area is all Over the Rhine. And, uh, you know, the area was, was settled by uh, German immigrants uh, in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and many of them were reminded of the Rhine River when they looked at the canal. So when you crossed the canal, you were going over the Rhine. That's how the community got its, uh, its name. And it was a thriving uh, neighborhood. Uh, there were lots of businesses there. There were bars and, and, and beer gardens and uh, beer brewers and lots of theaters and restaurants and people, lots and lots and lots of people. There were 45,000 people uh, in this area at the turn of the century. And that number declined by the time I came into office to about 8,000 people. So you can see a dramatic drop, but about 90% of the building stock that went up in the 1880s was still there in 2005. So the uh, area had 500 vacant buildings, there were 700 vacant lots, there were more than 1,600 vacant housing units, and a lot of work to be done. So I, I described 3CDC. 3CDC uh, started working in that area, and you can get a sense of what it looked like before. So they uh, sort of started acquiring buildings, they started land banking, they started getting the properties under control, uh, which is what you're seeing there, and uh, then they started their work. So this map, uh, this is supposed to be red, this color here is supposed to be red. It doesn't look red to me, I don't know if I'm colorblind or not, uh, but these are all the buildings that they land banked. These are the buildings that have been completed since 2005, and actually there's several more that have been completed since then. And the buildings in blue are the buildings that are currently under construction. So I'm gonna go back for a second so you can see that transformation. The land bank completed under construction. And so these, these are some before and after uh, pictures I want to show you. This is right at the corner of 12th and, and Vine, which is really where Over the Rhine starts as you come out of the business community. Uh, this is the after. This is before, just a shell. This is after. Before, the, there has been some new construction in the area. This is after. That's before. And that's after. And I'm not certain, but the, the feet, these feet right here, I think those are my mother's feet. <laughs> she was with me on the day that we uh, dedicated that building. I'm pretty sure those are her shoes. This is before, this is after. Now, I don't know, what's wrong with that wallpaper? <laughs> Got some of that in my house, looks fine. This is before, this is after. Before, after, this is before, this is after, before, and after. So this is an area of a lot of Italian aid housing, obviously. The, the whole area is on the National Historic Register, and um, it was considered to be endangered before 3CDC started their work. And you can see that the, there just has been a dramatic transformation uh, in this area. So far, more than 1,000 condos and apartments have been done. Uh, virtually all of them have been sold or leased. Uh, there are over uh, 800,000 square feet of retail space in this area. And uh, you can see it's just, it's just really been dramatic. This is like my favorite because this is the corner of 12th and Vine. And this was a bar for a number of years. And this was the number one call 
spot in the city of Cincinnati for police runs for decades. And people would hang out on this corner, and this is where you would come to get your crack cocaine for like a week at a time. Because apparently they're daily purchasers and then there are weekly purchasers. <laughs> and so on Sunday, I, I'm not joking really, on Sunday the weekly purchasers would come down and get enough to last them for uh, the entire week. And so this is um, what it looks like now. So that now this is a restaurant called A Taste of Belgium, and they serve chicken and waffles. So on Sundays, they have brunch, and you come down and get your chicken and waffles instead of crack <laughs> at, at that location. I mean, that's like a preferred retail option. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you guys are funny. And so, so far, the city has invested and this is specifically in Over the Rhine with 3CDC. The city has invested $98 million, $98 million, and that has leveraged more than $800 million in private redevelopment funds, $800 million. So that's a, a really dramatic transformation. This is Mercer Commons. This is uh, a new construction uh, phase that is going on right now. Uh, it's going to be 3,900 square feet of, of retail space, some additional condos, 25 or so. Uh, they're building a parking garage, 340 spaces. Phase two will have another 67 apartments, 30 of which will be affordable. Uh, another 10,000 square feet of commercial space. And then phase three is another 59 apartments with another 3,100 square feet of commercial space. This site is, is just about done. And uh, going to be dedicated soon. This is a rendering of it. I wish I actually had a photograph because it's almost done. I mean, it's almost ready to go. So Mercer Commons. So there's new construction and renovation happening all in the same neighborhood all at the same time. So Washington Park is, a, is another um, area of over the Rhine. And this park was developed in the 1880s. Um, it had become a haven for homeless people to hang out. It was bleak, uh, not a place you want to take your family necessarily. Uh, but uh, this was another area that we invested in. You can see what it looked like before. Uh, this is what it looks like after. We put $50 million into this park. There was a school uh, at this end of the park that was demolished. And then underneath, we, we, we dug down and, and uh, built a subterranean parking structure there. So we were able to extend the park all the way north uh, to 14th Street. And uh, it's been a huge success. The garage holds 450 cars. Uh, this is a huge civic lawn uh, that is used for all kinds of uh, programmed events. There are uh, feature, water features for the kids as a playground. Um, and now people from all walks of life come and enjoy uh, Washington Park. So last year we had an event in Washington Park where the symphony came out of the building, out of Music Hall, and performed out here. And people gathered on the lawn to, to watch the performance and a projection of, of like laser lights and things on the building itself. And 25,000 people showed up uh, over two days to see this performance. And it was the first time probably since the 1880s that 25,000 people had been in that park. And we did it again this year. And this year, uh, they distributed 35,000 tickets over uh, some website. And people went on and, and they gobbled up the tickets in 15 minutes. They were gone. And there was controversy because some people went on and got like, you know, 50 tickets and then they started selling them. And these, this is a free concert. You can't sell tickets to a free concert, for God's sakes, even in Cincinnati. And so, uh, so they added some more seats because people were very upset. They added another 1,500 seats. 70,000 people signed up for those 1,500 seats. It was crazy, but it was a great event. So we've worked on our riverfront. We've worked on our city center. We've worked in our most historic neighborhood over the Rhine. And it's one of the things that has people talking about what's going on in Cincinnati across this country. Uh, smart growth strategies are making way for the arrival of the 21st century city. 
And I think the cities that uh, embrace smart growth policies are the cities that are going to grow. These are the cities that are going to uh, see things happen, the cities that pay attention to their historic uh, preservation efforts, the cities that pay attention to uh, integrated transportation systems, the cities that have dynamic leadership, the cities with bold, visionary leaders. Um, that's why I think gatherings like this are so important, because you, you, you get uh, reinvigorated, right? and you, uh, people are brought together and you see what's going on in other parts uh, of the country and you go back, hopefully, hopefully, you go back recharged. And so the, the charge for tonight is that you all are experts in all of your various fields. You know a lot of things that your elected leaders may not necessarily know. And I will tell you right now that when I became the mayor, I didn't necessarily know everything that I'm here talking to you about today. I do, though, because somebody got in my ear. There was some uh, planner who said, Mayor, here's how this needs to work. Or there was some uh, transportation expert or some preservationist or some uh, economic development expert that said, Mayor, here's what you need to do in order to transform the city of Cincinnati. And, you know, the citizens of my city stopped me on the street and said, here's what I want to see happen in the city of Cincinnati. And so you have the same responsibility. You have to get to your leadership, you have to impart your expertise, and you have to help the leaders shape the vision for what Providence will become. That's your charge, that's your challenge, and it's frankly your civic responsibility. Because if you think about it, this city has some really great aspects to it. And I've been touring all over the place, and I've seen a lot of great things, and many of the things that I've seen today were built by people of previous generations. So they spent their time, their resources, their money, their ingenuity, and they made investments for the future. So now it's your responsibility to make similar investments for future generations of people that you will never meet. But the goal is there, the task is sometimes difficult, but the responsibility is yours. Thank you very much for having me, I really appreciate it. <laughs>